Welcome everybody. I am Jenna Black. I am primarily a high school science educator, but this summer I've been working with Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center on this project to try to increase seaweed education in Maine classrooms. Uh, Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center is a, a group that's trying to increase aquaculture education in the state of Maine and beyond. And um, we have been working with several partners on this project, Maine Ag in the Classroom, World Wildlife Fund, University of Maine Sea Grant, and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute to help uh, create a bunch of resources for Maine educators. And it's it's been super exciting. Um, so these have been our partners. So a huge thank you to everybody here who's been involved. Uh, so what we are trying to do is increase awareness around seaweed and seaweed aquaculture in Maine using a tool that was used in Alaska as well, which is this book, with a little help from our friends by Matthew Bate, illustrated by Liz Rowland. It's an absolutely beautiful book, and we are kind of using that as the anchor for this project. We are also kind of using our resources in Maine to ground all of the seaweed education in the state of Maine, to really make this a place-based project. Um, so we've been working with all kinds of people across the state in seaweed world to make that happen. Uh, so our project goals are really for students to become more aware what options there are in this workforce and also just that this exists. As far as what we are gonna be doing today, uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is do a little bit of information about why are we even talking about seaweed? Why does this matter? Um, and Maya is gonna give us a little bit of context for where Maine stands in you know, the world of seaweed and how the history of seaweed farming really began. Then I'm gonna spend some time talking with you folks about uh, what the project is and what we're actually creating for you. Then we'll have a little bit of time for some Q&A on those materials. And then we're gonna move right into our, our farmer panel. We have some really awesome farmers with us today, people who actually go out and grow seaweed. And we're gonna give you the opportunity to chat with them ask some questions about what that process looks like. And we have some awesome people, I'm so excited. So that is what we've got today. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is show you a little video from World Wildlife Fund about seaweed uh, aquaculture. And so Maya is gonna take us in that direction. All right, thanks, Jenna. So if you could stop sharing, I will start sharing. Perfect. Okay. Uh, let's see. Share sound. All right. You should be seeing the video. Is that correct? Awesome. All right. Here we go. I'm Bailey Moritz. I'm the program officer for seaweed and shellfish farming at World Wildlife Fund. I became interested in seaweed farming because my family worked in food systems. They were farmers in the Midwest, but I was always interested in the ocean and scuba diving and being by the coast. And so when I learned that you can actually produce food in the ocean, when I visited my first ever seaweed farm, um, I became really excited and have been working on seaweed ever since. Kelp is a type of seaweed or macroalgae, and there are three types of seaweed. There are browns, reds, and greens. And within each of those three categories, there are thousands and thousands of species that take many forms and have many different uses. But within the brown category, we have what are called kelps, which tend to have the biggest blades, they grow the fastest, um, and they do really well in cold water. So they're a wonderful way to produce a lot of seaweed really quickly. A kelp is made up of the blade, which is usually pretty long and wide and is what photosynthesizes and takes in all the sunlight for the seaweed to grow. Then the kelp has a stipe, which is hollow and allows the seaweed to float up and reach the sunlight. And it has a holdfast, which is at the bottom and helps the kelp attach to a rock or on a seaweed farm, attached to the string on that farm so that it stays in place in storms and tough wave conditions. 
So sugar kelp starts its life out as a small spore that a farmer can release from the reproductive tissue on a blade of kelp. And that spore will swim around in a tank until it's ready to attach to rope that the farmer has in tanks. And it'll grow in those tanks for 30 to 60 days, at which point the farmer can transport it out to their farm. And the seaweed will grow on ropes um, for three to six months until they're long enough to be harvested and brought back to the processing facility where they're stabilized and all the nutrients are locked in either by freezing, drying, or fermenting the seaweed. World Wildlife Fund is interested in seaweed farming and seeing it expand because of all the many benefits that it can provide both for our oceans as well as for coastal communities. Seaweed farming as it grows, takes up excess nutrients from the water, it can capture carbon, it creates habitat for a diverse range of, of important species in the ocean, and it can also combat ocean acidification locally. Seaweed is also a really valuable material to be used in everything from food for humans and livestock, as well as for things like packaging that can offset more carbon intense materials. Seaweed farming is also important for coastal communities as an additional form of, of income on coasts where fishing might be declining. I think we all should care about kelp farming because it offers a lot of hope in a world where there's a lot of difficult problems that we're trying to solve. Everything from climate change to ocean pollution to having sustainable food systems. And seaweed isn't a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all of those problems, but it's a really important tool to work towards a better planet and more sustainable communities. All right. So World Wildlife Fund, again, is one of our partners with this project, and they are actually helping to fund the um, the resources, the teachers' resources. So we're very excited and very grateful to them. Um, so next, I'm gonna share my screen again so you guys all get to see the next part of this presentation, which is me giving a bit of global context for the seaweed industry. Um, and you will see that as soon as I find the correct slideshow. There it is. <laughs> Perfect. Can you see it, Jenna? Is it all good? Good. Thanks, All right. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So a little bit of context for main seaweed industry. When someone says seaweed, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Maybe like me, it's Maine's rocky coast that's covered with this almost linguine like um, brown algae that we see. Maybe it's your favorite seaweed dish like sushi, or maybe it's giant kelp forests with little baby otters that are super cute that live in the seaweed. But whatever you're thinking of first, it's also really important to remember that seaweed is actually a huge global industry. So in 2020, 35.1 million tons of seaweed were landed in the, United, um, in the world, and that valued $14.11 billion. And this is the largest the industry has ever been. So right here, we're looking at this graph, and you can see as we go up through time, seaweed is increasing um, in the production. Now, a lot of this production is made up of five different types of algae um, or of seaweed. Um, these are three brown algae, uh, so that's, you're thinking the kelps, and then uh, two red algae, so that might be something like Irish moss if you've ever heard of it. Um, and these seaweeds are produced in all around the world, but there are primarily um, a couple different countries that are by far the largest producers, and that's China, Indonesia, South Korea, and the Philippines. And when they produce these seaweeds, there are so many different things that people are doing with them. So in the bottom of this slide, you can see things like seaweed kimchi, sushi, different types of cosmetic products like soap and raw seaweed that people are eating. So there's really so many different uses from food to pharmaceuticals to cosmetics, biofuels, and food additives. Back to this beautiful slide of Maine's rocky intertidal zone. So maybe like me, you're a little bit curious to know how seaweed has become a significant global industry. So let's think 
first about this diagram where we can see the inner tidal zone. And this, what we're going to see here is kind of how seaweed is growing. And so you can see that seaweed div lives in different zones, but it always is going to be living close to the shoreline because it needs to receive sunlight. And that's really critical um, for it to be able to produce its biomass. Um, now, in this intertidal zone, this is Maine's rocky intertidal, um, you can see that as the tide goes up, um, the seaweed would be covered. And as it goes down, you're seeing that maybe people would have more access to these seaweeds. Um, and so because seaweed has, uh, it lives close to the shoreline, which makes it easier to access. And we have these tides that allow um, people to actually go down among the seaweeds. It's been uh, an industry, or it's been a resource that people have been able historically to harvest in the wild. Now, that's something that we've seen all around the world. Um, and it was actually one of the first ways that human ancestors gathered seaweed, which they were primarily using for food. Now, something I think is really amazing is there's actually archaeological evidence in Chile as early as 14,000 years ago that people were harvesting wild seaweed. And there are also written records of seaweed harvest in China from over 1,700 years ago. But again, it's not seaweed wild harvest has not been limited to those two locations. Um, there's actually evidence on every continent where human civilization has developed that there have been people who were eating seaweed. So seaweed actually has been kind of involved with global human history um, in a really important way, which is really cool. So evolution of seaweed farming from kind of our wild harvest industry. So farming seaweed is a little bit different, um, actually a lot different in some ways from harvesting wild seaweed. Because first we've got people intentionally growing and controlling the environment um, where the seaweed is. And this is to maximize the production of seaweed. Um, and it's also a much more recent development on the scale of the global seaweed happenings. <laughs> so, you know, we had 14,000 years ago, people using seaweed in um, their diets from wild harvest in Chile, but much more recently, we have people beginning to develop cultivation of seaweed. And so actually, the first evidence of seaweed farming um, used very basic techniques of rock scraping. Um, and this happened in China about about a 1000 years ago. Um, and this was really to enhance the natural growth environment of the seaweed. And by doing that, um, they were kind of using a method that we might think of as like stock enhancement or what we might also call ranching. And then you fast forward um, to the 1600s when that's probably around, you know, like 350 years ago, the uh, people in Japan also began to farm seaweed. Um, but it wasn't really until the 1900s that seaweed farming be began to gain momentum as a practice. Um, so prior to that time, again, wild harvest was where seaweeds were produced, but by and large, people along the coast ate seaweed, but no one else was eating it. Um, however, in the 1900s, we see two things that happened. One was there was a Japanese kelp species that was introduced in Chinese waters, and two, post-World War II, um, China was uh, experiencing a really intense demand for inexpensive, nutritious food. And the government, along with researchers, decided to begin funding research for seaweed farming. Um, so at this point, the seaweed industry kind of globally began to become, or specifically the seaweed farming industry. So the difference again between the farming um, versus the wild industry, but the farming began to pick up momentum. And what we're really seeing at this point um, in the 1950s was critical advances in farming technology, breeding, and genetics that allowed for growth of the industry. And this particularly was happening in East Asia, in China, Japan, and South Korea. And part of the reason for that is that those countries already had long histories of people in coastal communities eating seaweed. So it was much easier for people to introduce the farm seaweeds um, into the culinary environments that they were finding there. So in this image, you can kind of see what we have um, as a seaweed farm set up here with this long line in the water. And then we have like a, an example of a seaweed farm that was maybe earlier and then one 
um, that's very large um, currently off the coast of China. So maybe you're wondering, how is Maine going to fit into this? So the United States does have a history of wild harvest of seaweeds. However, it really has been a new, uh, new practice emerging, the seaweed farming in the U.S. So if we're looking at the timeline here, we're thinking um, around 1996, 95, 96, the first seaweed farm in the United States began. And guess where it began? Down East Maine. So shout out to Down East Maine and the scientists and the company working on that. Um, and part of the reason why Maine was such a great place for farming seaweed was because we have cold, clean waters with lots of nutrients. And we also have the working waterfront in infrastructure, which is able to support emerging green industries. So even though in the U.S. right now, seaweed is still... Um, relatively small compared to other global seaweed industries. So we we do make up less than 1% of the global industry. Maine has been a really key player in our advances in seaweed farming. And not only did we have the first farm back in 1995, we also had the first commercial farm in 2010. So the first farms were kind of experimental, small scale things. And then now we have had farms that have begun to develop that are actually making a profit off of the seaweeds that they're selling and they're helping bring these products um, to consumers across the country, which is really exciting because more people are eating seaweed. Um, what's also interesting in Maine is we have, I think we currently have around 40, more than 40 farms that uh, span the entire coast. So there's really not a huge limit on like the the different types of communities that are able to engage in seaweed farming which is amazing and as of now only alaska is coming close to maine's production of edible seaweeds in the nation um so you can see in this graph over here this large blue at the bottom is maine um as of i believe 2020 yep and then this second one up here is the alaska and then these are the other um other northeast and western parts of the united states so maine again is a huge leader in this industry which is part of why we're so excited about it and so interested in it so just a final slide here a little bit about the the future areas for seaweed development so here you can see this is a united nations development um, sustainable development goals slide and it's just talking about why we should be so excited about seaweed there's so many different possibilities um, from things like fertilizers and um, feeding it to animals to also feeding humans and economic opportunities. Um, and so there's really just a lot of potentials here. And that's something that we want Maine to be able to access since we are doing so much here for the U.S. seaweed industry, which is really exciting. I um, mean, there's so many future develop possibilities for this industry to develop as well. And we want students to have access to these exciting opportunities, be it expanding engineering opportunities for seaweed farms or creating different culinary products or doing art that brings people closer to the oceans. Like there really is so much going on, which is um, one of the great opportunities for Maine students. And here I'm going to just say all it takes is a little kelp from our friends and shout out to the book. Um, that's you, Maine's teachers. And you can see what I did there. I'm just handing it off to Jenna, who is a Maine teacher, and she's going to talk more about this, um, about this project. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Maya. All right. I am going to take just a second to share my screen again. There. All right. We see me? We're good? Awesome. Okay. So Maya's talked a little bit about this, but I want to kind of take us back to why kelp for just a second. And the reason we're using kelp as an example in Maine is that it can be a really sustainable food source. So eating kelp is a, it's an incredibly nutritious thing, and we are able to grow it without having to use up land that can be used for other things. We don't need fresh water for it. We don't need to do anything for it except put it out into the water and wait which is awesome. Uh, kelp also has some bioremediation uh, impacts, which 
It helps remove excess carbon dioxide from the water around it, which we have too much of, which, you know, excess carbon dioxide is a part of the problem that's causing uh, ocean acidification. So we can help remove that impact where we're growing kelp. It also will help remove in the area where it's growing excess nitrogens and phosphates because that's part of what it needs to grow as well. So in a world where we have some harmful algal blooms happening from these excess nutrients in our waters, growing kelp is going to help relieve some of that pressure. Kelp helps support working waterfront as well. So if you are from coastal Maine, you are really familiar with the working waterfront. And it's a really important piece of our coastal industry. And it's the kind of thing that we need to protect because once we lose working waterfront to other uses, it's really difficult to get it back as working waterfront. So kelp is a way to help us preserve that in our coastal communities, which is awesome. And it also provides a way for fishermen to diversify their fisheries. Um, I grew up in a, a fishing family, a lobstering family, and over the years, it's become increasingly clear to me, if you are a fisherman in Maine, the odds are very high that the only thing that you are fishing is lobster. Um, and that's a lot of, you know, eggs in one basket, if you will allow me to mix in a terrestrial metaphor. So having kelp is a really excellent way to, to diversify the fishery because fishermen can uh, harvest kelp. They can grow kelp in the winter and they can still fish their regular season uh, throughout the summer. So using kelp and other aquaculture as a way to diversify what our fishermen are doing, a way to keep people working on the water is another thing that I'm really passionate about. Um, I suppose right now I should also mention that I, uh, I work at Belfast Area High School and we actually did have a kelp farm this year. So I can talk to you a little bit about kelp farming as well uh, when we get to Q&A. And most of the images that have kelp in my slides are from our kelp farm. So just a, a fun fact, I know I saw some RSU 71 emails. So just a little shout out for you guys who are in attendance, welcome. Um, so this is what a kelp farm looks like from the water. This photo was taken, I wanna say in March, maybe February, we had a really mild winter here. So we were able to spend a lot of time out on the farm. Um, are you guys able to see my cursor when I move it? Okay, so we have our red buoy that is gonna be attached to an anchor. Um, we have another buoy on the end, and these white buoys in the middle are going to show where our kelp lines exist. Um, but as you can see, this is an incredibly low visual impact way to, to use the ocean. And this gear is all out of the water in June when our school year ends. Um, this is, however, what this looks like underwater. This image was taken in April. The season that we are growing kelp was uh, from November to June. And during that time, we are able to grow from tiny, tiny seed, like you saw in that video, you know, just looks like fuzz on a line to kelp that we had some pieces that were probably seven or eight feet long, which was amazing. Um, and this creates such a, a beautiful product. Uh, here you can see, this is a harvest day and this is some of our kelp, we grew two species. This, what you have here is uh, something called a laria or winged kelp. And we also had some sugar kelp, but you know the, the volume of it just was so wildly impressive to us. Um, just a quick little further bit about kelp. Um, you know, we talked about the blade of the kelp, the stipe of the kelp and the hold fast. The hold fast is a, it looks like a root system, but it's not. Um, it is simply used to hold the, the algae in place. Um, Although it looks like roots, it's not because roots are actually taking up nutrients where in uh, our kelp, the entire blade is gonna be taking in those nutrients, the entire body of the, the organism as opposed to just the roots. So it's gonna be absorbing uh, light from the sun, carbon dioxide, nitrates and phosphates from the water going through that process of photosynthesis to produce sugars. And it's going to be growing incredibly quickly, which means that it's taking a lot of carbon out of the water as it goes. So if we think about you know, biomass, the longer and the larger that kelp grows, the more carbon it's taking out of the water around it, which right now in the world that we live in is an incredibly good thing. It's also producing oxygen. Uh, just a fun little shout out for algae. Um, if you wanna take two breaths for me right now, you can say thank you algae for one of those breaths. Half of the oxygen that you breathe 
is created by marine algae, kelp being one of them, not the only, but one of them. <clears throat> so what do we need to grow kelp? We need kelp seed. Now, uh, this is not like a packet of seeds that you would get from, you know, Johnny's, but it is uh, seed in that it starts very small and will grow. Uh, we get this from source tissue from wild kelp right now, uh, but there is work being done to make us less reliant on those wild strains, which is really exciting. Um, we put that seed out on lines where our, our seeded twine gets schooled off onto long lines, which is basically lobster trap rope. And uh, for our project, we had lines that were about um, 400 feet long. We have three of those. And this growth all happens through winter. Now, the er early stages of growth are pretty slow. And that has everything to do with the fact that we're not getting the hours of daylight you know, in that winter phase. But as soon as our days start getting longer, you know, say in early March, the growth accelerates incredibly. It was so cool to see, you know, one day you go out and there's still just kind of some fuzz on the line. And then a couple of weeks later, you have like actual kelp. It's the coolest thing I've ever done. Um, but the fact that this growth is through winter means that it's a relatively hands-off process for the grower, which is uh, a, a good thing, I think. Um, so we would go check our lines a few times, but the you know once the the hard work was done once our lines were set until harvest and then we harvested throughout may one of the really cool things that we had access to was our high school students so our high school students did 100 percent of our kelp harvest which was awesome um so for, for this project this is some of our students doing kelp harvest out on the bay which was um it was it was so fun uh, so, but student outcomes for our project here is that students will be able to identify where they may be using or eating seaweed in their everyday lives. Uh, so all of you probably have used seaweed sometime today, this week, without realizing it because seaweed products um, and extracts are used in a lot of things that we use every day. Uh, a lot of toothpastes, for example, are going to use a seaweed extract to get that uh, toothpastey texture everyone loves. Students should be able to describe how seaweed grows once they've gone through this process. They should be able to identify possible jobs related to the seaweed industry. And this is something that we do really want to focus on because right now um, this industry is in a growth mode and a lot of people don't really even know it exists unless you've witnessed it. So allowing students to see that this is something that exists and is a potential job, especially at this elementary level, uh, really gives them the opportunity to dream. And that's exciting for us. Uh, they should be able to describe the benefits growing seaweed provides for the water it grows. So that bioremediation thing that I was talking about earlier and how also growing seaweed can provide benefits to the community involved. So that work around preserving working waterfront and um, that kind of stuff is gonna be another piece of this. All right, so what if you are partaking in our program, and I do want to say for a quick moment, um, we are focusing around fifth grade education. That is not to say if you're not a fifth grade teacher, you can't be involved, but just have in mind that that's what our materials are geared towards. Um, so the education materials include a copy of the book with a little help from our friends. We are also making a series of videos. So in this book, there are chapters almost where different topics are addressed. And we have matched each of those topics with videos of people in different parts of the seaweed industry and research base in Maine, which is really exciting because this book, although it's beautiful and wonderful and has so much material and education, is written uh, in, in Australia. So we really wanted to make sure that we were grounding this in Maine. And that's what these videos do. We get to see different parts of the coast. We get to see different work that's being done in seaweed world. Uh, I'm really excited for you all to see these videos. And we also have educational activities from our partners that are aligned to each topic. Um, and these are the topics that we've outlined in the book. So there is an introduction that kind of gets you settled in. Then we dive right in uh, to early earth and seaweed. Seaweed is a really important thing to how the world works now in that we have oxygen in our atmosphere. Uh, we talk about the reproduction and hatcheries aspect of seaweed. So how seaweed's able to reproduce and also what we are doing to try to grow seaweed and make it 
less reliant on those wild populations for our seed. Um, the ecology of seaweed. So what does seaweed do in the larger system that it's a part of? Um, I will give a quick spoiler. Um, in this section, we do talk about lumpfish, which are my favorite. And there's some really cute video of lumpfish. So if you are here for nothing else, please make sure you come back for lumpfish video. Um, then we talk about seaweed as food. Seaweed as a food is an incredible thing because it's incredibly nutritious. It's um, really low on the food chain. So if you are mindful about sort of your environmental impact of your eating, seaweed is a good thing to consume. And it's also really good. Um, diversity in the industry and uh, kind of some history on the working waterfront. So in these videos, we have some actual old school, like old salt fishermen involved talking about the changes of our working waterfront over the years and some new people who are coming into the industry. Uh, one of the most exciting things for me is that the more I spend time in the seaweed world, just see there's women everywhere. It's so cool. Uh, we talk about seaweed and health. So there's some real health benefits to eating or using seaweed in your personal care. Native peoples and seaweed. So there is a really strong history and Maya touched on this of uh, native and indigenous people using seaweed. We're gonna talk some about seaweed in maritime history. I bet you didn't know that seaweed attempted to thwart Christopher Columbus once upon a time. Um, we'll talk a little bit about seaweed product development. So as Maya kind of led off with, as sometimes the associations we have with seaweed are ew and slimy, which um, I understand and would like to validate that response, but hopefully we can all grow from there because it's such an incredible thing. But the product development piece is uh, challenging, you know, trying to fight with some of these preconceived notions about seaweed and thinking about how we can think about seaweed and rebrand seaweed to make it something that people are excited to use and eat. We have an entire section devoted to seaweed and cows. I don't wanna kind of spoil the line on this, but there's a really cool thing that can happen when you feed seaweed to cows. And we are going to be talking with someone who's done some really um, you know, milestone research on, on this project or on this you know, topic. Um, we'll talk about seaweed ecological services and what a changing ocean can benefit from seaweed. And then we'll talk about seaweed aquaculture and permaculture more specifically, and then we'll have uh, kind of a conclusion. So those are the topics that we have outlined as different pieces that we're gonna reinforce with an activity and a video. Some ex examples of our activities are our kelp forest towers. So this is a, an activity that was created by the 4-H Humane uh, Extension, and it uses a modified Jenga set to really show how changes in an ecosystem can reverberate through that ecosystem. Um, it's also super fun for our fifth grade friends who uh, will learn that they don't want their ecosystem tower to collapse, but also it's kind of fun when it does, when it's just in the context of Jenga. Uh, there is a seaweed evolution game, and this will involve getting kids up and really uh, reinforcing the steps that our seaweed went through in that evolutionary history while they get to kind of go around and move and play, which is exciting. Uh, there is going to be some instructions and materials to create an intertidal mural, which is really fun and going to be really pretty by the time you're done, but this will reinforce some of the things about why we have these different types of seaweeds, why you find different types of seaweeds in different places, um, and really understanding that impact on why the intertidal zone looks the way it does. And then finally, you know, not finally, but another example is an, a uh, look at how Greenhouse gas can change the temperature of an atmosphere. Uh, this is a neat little activity that uses Alka-Seltzer to produce carbon dioxide in a closed system. And you compare that to a system without that excess carbon dioxide and see how the temperature of the air in that closed system can change as a result. Uh, so those are just some of the activities. Like I said, each of these topics has its own activity, but these are just some of the examples. Um, we are gonna be putting this all on a website. I've got a quick little screenshot here of um, the, the mobile version. But uh, so we are going to organize all of these by topic on Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center's website. And again, each topic is gonna to have a video, an educational activity and the corresponding pages in the book. So if you wanna go through the whole book, Awesome. If you say like, hey, I don't know if I'm up for tackling this whole book, that's a lot of different stuff, but 
I really want to use some of this stuff in my classroom, you can still get a book, you can still work through with the pages that you want to work through and kind of piece together how you'd like to move through this stuff. Um, there's also those extension activities listed by topic. And this is where I'm going to say if you're interested in receiving a copy of the book, there's an interest form on our website. And I think uh, somebody's going to pop that in the chat sometime soon for me. Uh, some of you probably have filled this out already. Um, but if you haven't and you do want a copy of the book, please do fill out this uh, Google form to indicate your interest and we'll make sure that you can get a book. Um, so, come on now. This is the part where I open things up to questions about our resources and material. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, as people are putting stuff into the chat or into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask Jenna so she can answer the questions. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask, so is this, does anyone have to pay for this? And nope. where are the materials gonna be located? Like, are they gonna be all on the website? What's the deal with that? So all of the materials are going to be on the website organized with the sections that they are relevant to. Um, these are not things that should cost you money, access to any of this. The book is going to be sent to you for free if you are, you know, interested in getting a copy of the book. Um, did I answer that, Maya? I think I did. Yeah, perfect. And for people who are signing up for this form and they're like, when am I going to get sent a book? When are they expecting? When can we say that they would be expecting to receive these books? We are looking to start mailing um, before the end of August. So. Hopefully early September is when you should be receiving materials at the latest. Awesome. Okay. And we have a question coming in from the chat right now, which is what is a rough timeline for working through all the topics? Um, so I guess I, I would say it, sorry, this answer is going to be a little unsatisfying. It does depend. <laughs> so if you want to work through all of the topics, some of them are going to take a little bit longer than others. Um, but there are, I think, 15 topics. So I would say planning on 30 to 40 minutes per topic. So it can be quite an undertaking, which is why I did say, you know, you do have the option to piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Our videos are going to be 10 minutes or less though. We are trying to keep in mind that fifth grade attention span. Perfect, okay, great. Um... I have a couple other questions coming in. So one of the questions um, is about how we're gonna be distributing these resources to fifth grade and then considering others. So could you talk a little bit about the, um, the workshop that we're gonna be having? So um, fifth grade is, like I said, our, our, our focused demographic. However, if you are interested, we are going to be having a uh, workshop that is coming up in November, November 3rd, we should have registration available for that soon. It's not out available yet, but if you fill out that form that Annie put in the chat, you will be able to get information on our, our workshop when it's available. And everyone who attends the workshop will also be getting a copy of the book. Awesome. And if there are other elementary teachers that are interested in, like they work with different grades, but they're interested in the book, will they? Um, yeah be prioritized also yes yes okay great um that one is done so uh we have another question who do we reach out to with questions throughout the project um i would think that would be the maic email yes so um somebody will put in the chat right now uh an email that is uh monitored by the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center team. So that's going to be me and also Ann Langston Knoll, who is um, answering many of your questions in the uh, in the Q and A live right now, and she's the associate director. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and then we have another question: Was fifth grade chosen as the demographic based on the reading level of the book? So fifth grade was chosen. Uh, we did take into consideration reading level. 
but we also took into consideration what the science standards are outlined by the next gen science standards for fifth grade and what aligned best with the topics. Um, and also just sort of conceptually the, the ideas that were going on in the book. Okay, great. So how have, um, how have you connected the education materials that we've been developing to the science standards? So um, those are, once we have our website up, we're also gonna have listings of what science standards connect to each activity. Um, so that's done, you know, looking at the next gen science standard and also the cross cutting concepts that are aligned with it. Okay, great. And for folks who may be at either joining this webinar who are um, below like uh, earlier grades or later grades, um, how do you think that this book may be able to be adapted in, for their types of curriculums? Um, so I think that a motivated classroom teacher is always very good at making something fit. Um, so in that way, I think, you know, if you're excited about this, go for it. Uh, I just want to say that because of what the standards are involved in fifth grade, that's why we chose that. Again, that's not to say that you can't do this in second grade. Um, I am also including sort of a word wall um, along with this book so that if you are working with students who really benefit from having all of that available to them visually, that's something that you can also take you know, use of. Um, just understanding that, uh, especially stuff like talking about you know, seaweed reproduction, there are words like eggs and sperm that are involved. It's not you know, explicit, but it does use appropriate scientific terminology. So I would say just sort of, if you are approaching this with younger students, kind of be aware of the context in which you are presenting this because of the kinds of questions that could potentially come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great answer. Um, and we had someone say, is this book going to be sent as a hard copy? Um, the answer yeah. to that is yes. And we will be reaching out to people who have filled out the form um, to receive your uh, addresses and we will be sending it through the mail. Again, you don't have to pay for that. Um, the grant that we have uh, gratefully received is going to be paying for that first. Um, also, this is just an opportunity that I'm going to take to say regarding people who are working with students of different education levels beyond um, elementary school. If you're super, super excited about seaweed and you really want more resources, um, we suggest that you reach out and just mention that to us because we are going to be looking for future opportunities for applying for funding to continue developing curriculum um, beyond yeah. fifth grade. So we can't give that to anyone now, but we having the interest expressed is really helpful to us because it allows us um, to kind of demonstrate to people like, hey, this is something people really wanna see. Um, and so we would love to see that. Also, <laughs> sorry, Jenna, I'm just gonna <laughs> say, you farm kelp in your, with your high school students. So I, I I, uh, she's a great resource. <laughs> yeah, feel free uh, to reach out. Um, my my email, I can I can put that in the chat for if you are interested in talking to me about, you know, how to get your higher education. Um, I am also a marine biologist by background, so um, I'm happy to help. Uh, Oh, and we have someone in the chat that just said this would also align with the main studies required course that must be taken between sixth and 12th grade. So thank you, Erica, for mentioning that. That's super helpful information. So yeah, there's a Erica, plug thank right you. there. Um, as far as blind spots, uh, I am a science educator. So when we're talking, you know, other other topics, there are certainly applications for this outside of science world, but NGSS was the wheelhouse I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, we have another question that just came in. I think Annie will answer that one also, um, but about connecting with, with kelp farmers. So, all right. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I'm like, oh, pressing information that needs to be, to be asked. Um, just give anybody else a minute, again, asking any questions about the curriculum, about the project that we're working on, again, 
the overview, this project is funded by World Wildlife Fund. Um, it's a partnership between Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center, Maine Agriculture in the Classroom, uh, Gulf of Maine Research in Institute, the University of Maine, Maine Sea Grant. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Um, it is a project that we hope you will make use of because we are so excited to be bringing it to you. And Jenna has done so much. She's an amazing educator. Just shout out Jenna. Thank you. Um, and I've played kelp Jenga and it's really fun. And I'm like, I'm post-college. So, you know, I would have played it with my college friends. <laughs> so. And yeah. I have run kelp Jenga with, uh, with young students and it's a rollicking good time. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. Um, okay. I think uh, we're going to move on to our panelists, right? I think we are. Yeah. So again, if anybody has questions for this throughout the um, throughout this the rest of this webinar, you can always put things in into the Q and A, uh, and one of us will do our best to respond um, before the end. But now I'm gonna introduce our lovely uh, Jenna. I'm gonna unspotlight you, so you're you're Off free for now. Um, <laughs> Uh, just for a moment. So I'm actually just going to share some logos here, which you should be seeing now. Yeah, good. All right. Um, so we're going to start our farmer pan or not beyond farmer plus panel, <laughs> um, because we do have a few folks on here who are actually involved in different parts of the seaweed industry. And what we want to do right now is bring all of you folks who have um, attended this webinar the opportunity to talk to people who are directly involved with making all of this amazing seaweed stuff happen. So we have um, from Maine Sea Grant, Jacqueline Robidoux, from Nautical Sea Farms, Morgan Fogg, from Oceans Balance, Dave, uh, David Labby, and from um, North Coast Seafood, we have Andrew Wilkinson. And I'm just going to stop sharing and spotlight these folks. Um, and then they're going to give a little bit of an introduction about themselves. And then we'll have an opportunity to ask them all questions. So. I'm gonna add as they come up. And there's Morgan. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna have, um, we're just gonna have starting off um, Jacqueline, if you'd like to go first and um, then we'll go right through and they're gonna give an introduction. So thank you. Of course, and thank you guys for having me on this panel. Um, always fun to hear about uh, education with seaweed because um, I'm obsessed with seaweed and I wish I had those kinds of opportunities to have discovered it before college. Um, so my name is Jacqueline Robidoux and I'm a Marine Extension Associate with Maine Sea Grant. Um, what I do is seaweed extension and so I work uh, directly with farms, businesses, regulators, scientists, teachers, students, folks like yourself. Uh, Maine Sea Grant is a university-based program, um, so we are through the university, which um, kind of has a tie-in to both students and research. And um, kind of my role in the seaweed space is in the uh, development and supporting the sector. And so especially as we've seen seaweed emerging um, in Maine in the way that it has, uh, it's very exciting to think about how we can engage uh, new folks, young people, um, folks like your you know, students uh, in seaweed education and get them involved in a growing uh, sector and opportunity for the state. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Um, Dave, if you want to go next, that would be great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. So um, I'm David Labby, I'm head of operations at Oceans Balance. Um, we're a vertically integrated seaweed company based in Biddeford, Maine. Um, basically just meaning that we're involved in growing, processing, packaging, um, and selling different various kelp products and sustainably wild harvested seaweed products um, across up to 10 different species now. So we're pretty, pretty proud of that. Um, so we're really focused on creating products that help eliminate some of the difficulty of 
um, introducing seaweed into into your diet. So we really like to think of um, you know helping educate consumers and really growing our customer base by providing um, you know kind of gateway seaweed products into uh, for the market where people that aren't generally um, you know familiar with cooking seaweed might know how to use them and uh, I think that's kind of how I was introduced into seaweed was through you know sushi, sushi and uh, uh, miso soup and seaweed salad so that definitely kind of um, provided the the interest for me to want to pursue this uh, further and that's what we're trying to do great thanks so much Dave um, Andrew if you want to go next oh you got to unmute just a sec there you go. Perfect. Jared, thank. Well, again, thanks for having me. I seem to be a bit of the uh, wild card, secret weapon uh, person in the in the somewhat of the kelp industry because I am catering to the cafeteria part, uh, which is being paired in the classroom as well. So my story is I developed uh, the uh, kelp meatball and kelp sliders, also known as seaweedish meatballs. Um, which are now being served throughout Massachusetts and New England, and we uh, moving into Maine as well. My project was actually, as so I'm the chef R&D here, and through COVID, when everything stopped, I was lucky enough to be able to follow my passion project of developing Maine kelp into a center of the plate item. So there are a lot of great seaweed and kelp products out there, but there weren't many that you could actually put onto a cafeteria tray. Um, and I find that if you can please kids with a kelp product and then have it become an accepted uh, product in their life and their nutrition every week, then it's much easier to bring it on and it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier to talk about in the classroom as well. Um, I did not want to make the kelp meatballs, the seaweedish meatballs, a uh, meat analog. So I turned it into a sort of a very healthy uh, kelp nugget, a veggie nugget, a veggie burger, if you will, that would be used to replace some of those commodity vegetable uh, burgers that are out there, which are high in soy products, um, a lot of preservatives that you can't uh, even produce, but He's a very clean product. First ingredient is always going to be main kelp. Then I use fresh green chickpeas, ground rice, pea protein, and then uh, extra virgin olive oil, basil. It's very herby. Um, so picture it as the, one of the best veggie burgers or veggie nuggets that you've had. And we're having a lot of luck here in Massachusetts by creating a classroom uh, curriculum not quite as extensive as you, I just listened to, which is fantastic. Um, but when you have the opportunity to have it in your cafeteria for lunch, nothing is going to be more accepting uh, to a fifth grader or K through 12 as dipping that uh, kelp nugget into a little ranch dressing and say, woohoo, okay, what'd you have for lunch today? I had kelp for lunch today, mom, dad, that's pretty cool. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, I would love to come to a cafeteria near you and uh, pair up the classroom with the nutrition services. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. And Morgan, let's hear about it. Yeah, thanks, Maya. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. This is very cool. I also am somebody who wishes that they stumbled on seaweed much earlier in life. Um, it's very cool. Um, yeah, I got involved in seaweed around uh, 2016, 2017, actually sort of um, starting a farm and also starting another company, which was called Akua. It still exists today. Um, Akua, A-K-U-A. Um, we were making kelp jerky at the time. So it was a plant-based, seaweed-based, uh, vegan jerky. They now make burgers um, as well. 
And um, yeah, at the same time started my farm. I was actually living out in Colorado. I was from Maine originally um, and decided to move back home to get involved in, in seaweed farming. Um, Jake Patron is my partner. He grew up on the water. So he had a lot of experience sort of um, just, you know, lobster fishing and a whole, a whole range of things on the water, which was great and super helpful. At the time, there was not nearly as many resources regarding seaweed farming as there are today. So um, we, we kind of just had to figure it out and learn from a few of the people that were in the industry already doing it. Um, but yeah, we started Nautical Farms. We were initially just a farm at the time. We were selling all of our crop wet to a processor that went on to make it into food or whatever um, was going on with it at the time. And then pretty quickly realized that we wanted to one, be more involved, but also um, just kind of really make seaweed farming work for us as a full-time income. And so um, we transitioned into making different products. So we now make value-added food products. We also do bath products um, and we're heavily focused on quality of seaweed as well as um, our entire process being as regenerative and eco-friendly as possible. So all of our packaging is um, either reusable or compostable. Um, and we really um, consider that very heavily in, in our entire process when we're creating. So uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions or anything, but that's a little bit of the gist. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to add Jenna and I back in now. Um, and what we're going to do is anybody who has questions for any of our four wonderful panelists, please, please, please put them in the Q&A. They are here to answer your questions. Um, and while we're waiting for a couple to come in, um, we're going to just start by asking you some of our questions. Um, so I think I'm going to go first with what is your favorite seaweed product to eat? Um, and I know some of you have already said that, but I would love to hear it again um, because I need some advice on what I need to be eating right now. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll just tag David first, and then we can bounce through, just tag somebody else who's next in line, David. So. Yeah, favorite, favorite seaweed product. That's, uh, it's definitely a difficult one. Um, I'd say my favorite species uh, might be Atlantic nori, uh, Porphyra. I, I really like it. It's a red, red algae. Um, I really like that one. Obviously, kelp is a is a pretty versatile ingredient, especially if you can get it off of the farm um, in April or May when you're harvesting and take a little bit home before it's it's dried or processed. Um, so that's always an exciting time of year is to, to get some fresh kelp off the farm and play around with it in the kitchen a little bit. Um, I'm a seaweed salad fan, like I said earlier, like I, I love seaweed salad. Um, so whether that's Alaria um, or it's uh, Saccharina, um, both those brown algaes, I think make make really good seaweed salads. Great. Um, I'll tag Jack's next. Jacqueline. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. I, Dave, 100% agree with you. My favorite species to eat is also Atlantic nori. Um, and so that's one of those red species that y'all heard um, in the video with Bailey. For kelp, um, especially the products that are produced here locally, it is so hard to pick a favorite because they are all incredible. Um, so I guess it kind of depends on the day, but I would say the things that I am generally drawn to are definitely things like seaweed salads, whether that is um, you know, right off the shelf ones or a homemade um, seaweed salad. And I think people usually get a chuckle out of this one, but I love putting seaweed salads on top of hot dogs. I feel like it's a really fun uh, summer twist on your regular average hot dog. So it works really good as a condiment replacement for like um, sauerkraut or other stuff. And so I'm always screaming seaweed on hot dogs from the rooftops and all at, at all barbecues. <laughs> I've heard somebody on the rooftop screaming that it must have been it's you. <laughs> I will also say that that method was what got my 70 something year old fisherman father to have kelp for the first time. So <laughs> if it works, it works. Um, Morgan, if you want to go. Yeah, sure. Um, seaweed on hot dogs is very, very good. I will second that. Um, 
Yeah, I think my favorite species to eat is probably Alaria. I love it fresh off the farm. It just, to me, it has this like little olivey taste to it. It just, I really, really love it. And it's um, very good when it's dried as well. Um, a little bit milder than sugar kelp, although I love kelp too. It's just um, a little bit more mild. Um, but my favorite product right now, um, yeah, I love sprinkling kelp and different things into like chocolates. I make cookies a lot at home, um, chocolate covered strawberries with sugar kelp flakes on them, anything with chocolate. I'm just, like love sweets. So um, is totally up my alley. The other thing that I've been making, um, and I know a company Barnacle, um, Barnacle Foods makes one. I have not had theirs, but I've been making a homemade chili oil, which is also absolutely incredible. Um, and I'm not somebody who actually loves spicy foods, but um, this definitely hits the spot. So. Uh, yeah, there's so many different things to do with it, for sure. They're all delicious. Great. Um, and Andrew, last but not least, the chef in the room. <laughs> if you don't say seaweed burger or seaweed... <laughs> uh, <laughs> seaweed I am very... Uh, I, I'm in love with the Atlantic Sea Farms uh, ginger sesame burger, for sure, uh, that can be taken out of the freezer and cooked in a pan in minutes. But their new product that just came out, the goju jang uh, seaweed, uh, fermented seaweed salad is off the hook if you like a little spice in your life. And the sea chi is fantastic. Um, but when you try the meatballs that are in your freezer, <laughs> uh, I, I, I love the, uh, as a chef, it's so versatile to use that sugar kelp and use it in such a way to make it taste great and become an acceptable item in your life. You know, I know everyone talks about like the toothpaste and the magic things that it's used for, but uh, when it's paired with the right vegetable, it's just, uh, it's really magic. It's really magic. Great. I love it. Okay. Jenna's going to go next. I can agree with that. Um, all right, so we've got a question from the Q&A. Uh, so somebody asking about, is it possible to do you know, a sampler where people can purchase a packet for the classroom, including samples of foods, different seaweed products? Um, so is that something that we might be able to make happen? Uh, I, of course, uh, North Coast Seafoods would be happy to ship a sample to uh, anyone who's interested, and especially to pair up you with your nutrition uh, director, your food service coordinator director uh, in your district um, to do a, a Zoom call uh, would be great to see how, uh, how best we think to cook it and then have you guys try it there. Uh, it's tough traveling around the state of Maine uh, with these demos, but happy to do that. Yeah, I, I second that too. We have a, um, a sampling program here so we can send out um, all the various species we have, whether you want to try whole leaf flakes or powder form. And uh, we also have a um, sampler pack on our website that's kind of curated for that role. I'm actually uh, embarrassingly not 100% familiar with what is actually in that because I'm not super close to the shipping department anymore. Um, but um, there is an option just to order it right through our website, as well as um, if you send me a direct email, I can put something together for you. Awesome. Great. Um, Morgan, we actually also had a question specifically for you, um, which was if it's possible for people to do classroom visits on your farm if they're in the area. Um, oh, potentially. Yeah, we haven't done that in the past, um, but reach out um, through our website, hello at nauticalfarms.com, morgan at nauticalfarms.com or our emails, um, and we'd be happy to try to coordinate something um, when it makes sense, when we actually have, we will be planting here in November and harvesting late spring, so um, if we could coordinate something with the classroom um, mm -hmm. within that time frame, we'd be happy to try to figure it out. Awesome. And just for anybody who's watching the webinar right now, um, for all the, the panelists, like I will send out an email after this webinar um, with contact information and more information about each of their organizations. So you don't need to be like frantically trying to figure out who they are right now. That will all come to you. Um, and I think that they would be happy to answer questions via email. Um, 
if you have specific things for them as well. Um, Jenna, do you want to ask another question? Yeah, um, we have one that's specifically for Chef Andrew, and I think he he did answer this, but we'll make sure we got it. Uh, did I understand correctly that you would like to visit my school and test seaweed foods on my fifth graders? That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, if it is uh, sort of in that southern main area, I would be happy to come, um, but it may be easiest with the bulk of the school districts to send samples and then do a Zoom call with the kitchen and the uh, food service director so we can coordinate how best to incorporate these uh, kelp meatball nuggets into your program and make them uh, taste great. Wonderful. Um, we have another question actually. So this is for everybody and it's gonna be fun to answer, but we would love to know what fun facts you can share about seaweed and or seaweed farming that teachers might be able to share with their students. Um, and I'll start with Morgan, if you wanna go first on this one. and. <laughs> Everybody else will call you out next. So get ready. <laughs> yeah, fun fact. Um, hmm. Actually, my fun fact is usually the, the oxygen fact, which we already covered. Um, a lot of people don't know that about seaweed. Um, yeah, I would say the other thing that a lot of people maybe don't um, either think about or know is just that it is opposite season of lobster fishing. So it fits in really, really well with a lot of the other things that the coastal communities in Maine already do um, and doesn't necessarily have to interfere. And so I think when a lot of people sometimes come to seaweed or they think about seaweed farming, they think of um, you know, taking up a bunch of bottom and they're everywhere all the time. And that's just not the case. Um, and so it, it fits in really, really well. So um, yeah, we like to make sure that people know that, that there's a season for it. And it's actually the completely opposite season of pretty much everything else, which it fits in really lovely. Great. Uh, all right, Andrew, you want to go next? Uh, it wasn't that long ago. I want to say about 10 or 12 years ago that kale was basically a garnish in fish cases at most seafood stores around the East Coast. And now kale is one of the most trendiest uh, leafy vegetables out there. And when I go visit a lot of higher ed in K through 12, and they're like, I just got used to eating kale. Now you want me to eat kelp? So, um, but once they learn it takes no land, no fresh water, no food, no pesticides, no herbicides. It stops them in their tracks and it's, they become believers right away. So it's, it's, uh, it's fun. I find that very fun. Perfect. Um, all right, David. Yeah, one of the, uh, I guess one of the things that always gets me is just how quickly it grows. And I think uh younger kids would be interested in that i mean we had some blades on our farm that were approaching 12 feet and that's in about four to five months and in reality a lot of that growth happens in about 60 days towards uh, the spring so you really can see when you go out um you know even three four days later and it's like it seems like it's almost put on an extra two feet that's always pretty exciting just how quickly um, it does grow and it, it shows you, I guess, how um, regenerative and how, how good it can be for the environment. Um, and then one of the things that I always like to say is uh, it's, I think of algae as kind of the building blocks of nutrition really on the planet. Uh, when you think about the cycle of the ocean and, you know, why salmon's healthy, why oysters are healthy, well, it all comes back to the fact that um, farther down the food chain, they're eating algae. So um, I like to eat lower down the food chain. I like to, to say um, less bioaccumulation of heavy metals um, and go straight to the source for the nutrition. And, and that's uh, one of the you know, great proponents of, of seaweed. Um, I wanna just quick ditto on David, the amount of growth in that kelp farm this year, like it was wild. We put this line out, we didn't really even like know it was gonna grow. And then every time we went out and checked the line, there was just like more and more kelp. It was amazing. <laughs> All right, Jack, sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> in there, but go for it. 
No, I can hear, I can listen to y'all talk about um, amazing kelp growth all day. Um, I would say one of the fun facts uh, that I find is uh, we have about 200 species of seaweed in Maine. Um, so when you're thinking like, you know, how many of those thousands that were mentioned in that video are we working with? Um, we have about 200. And then um, particularly, I think in foraging classes, this is a question that comes up, like, will any of them kill me? Um, like people have in their mind, like mushrooms and stuff, and um, we don't have any poisonous seaweeds. So uh, rest assured, you can eat them, but some will taste better than others. So definitely leave it to the pros like Andrew to cre create great kelp meatballs. <laughs> Right. Awesome. Uh, next question is how, in your opinion, has kelp farming or these kelp products helped pr improve the community that this is taking place in? And I don't know, does somebody want to volunteer for first or should I pick? Well, I, okay. I, Go ahead. Obviously, the awareness factor, um, because it is fairly new as it as it scales up to a much larger poundage every year, uh, the awareness that it's out there. Obviously, if in my world, if you can make it taste good um, and convince them with one bite that it's not going to taste like low tide, it's going to taste like a great um, vegetable veggie experience. Um, so I, I think just the awareness factor is, uh, really helps the community, um, in a world that, uh, is so full of, uh, not to disparage uh, those meat analog products, but we got used to eating, um, um, some science projects rather than eating real food and kelp, uh, with a lot of the people who are working these kelp food products right now are making them real food, very healthy, great ingredient panels and nutritional panels. So uh, I think it's great awareness for nutrition for the future. Yeah. Morgan, you've unmuted, go for it. Yeah, I was just gonna say, one of the things that I really love seeing um, amongst seaweed and aquaculture in general, to be honest, whether it's mussels or oysters, whatever people are growing, is just the collaborative nature that aquaculture seems to bring. Um, lobster fishing and some of these industries that have, you know, um, that Maine has had for years, generations and generations, um, tend to be very like everybody's kind of siloed and, and nobody's like really sharing any information. And it's like where they put their traps and everything is very secretive. Um, and seaweed, I think, and aquaculture in general has kind of opened that up and people are very collaborative and willing to share information and work with each other. And, um, I, I think that's great. I think that, you know, together we go farther. So I think that's, it's one of my favorite things that I see within the coastal communities of Maine. Great, David. Yeah, I'll definitely um, second everything Morgan said. Um, working within the coastal communities and to diversify the income is um, always important. As an operations guy, I definitely have to speak to um, down here at Biddeford, the job creation that we've we've been a part of. Um, really, you know, providing um, good level, good paying jobs, sustainable jobs, but also what I always like to point to is the fact that it's such a new industry and there really is an opportunity for anyone getting involved, um, you know, for years and years down the road. Um, whereas one of the reasons that drew me to the seaweed industry to begin with is it's just, um, you can really make a name for yourself because it's such a small industry and there is so much collaboration that there's a lot of opportunity for, for growth within, um, you know, a long-term career. Um, so I like to, you know, always use the analogy of, Agriculture has been around for 10,000 years, but aquaculture, barring maybe Japan and uh, some of the other areas that have done it for longer, it's very new uh, within the last couple decades in Maine. So you can really, um, you know, add your skill set into, um, you know, the industry in a valuable way and, and feel good about what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you, David. Jackson, you want to finish it off for us? Yeah, for sure. And um, again, totally reiterating everything that the other panelists have said. Uh, I think one of the things that I would add here too is 
the ways in which um, seaweed supports uh, Maine's uh, ocean and coastal environments. And so if you think about how Maine is looking forward to climate action, seaweed does play a really big part in that, um, whether that is the fact that it is you know, climate friendly agriculture, or it is improving the oceans through the process of growing and being farmed. Um, it also puts us on the map for things like uh, carbon sequestration and carbon capture that uh, the rest of the world uh, is is interested in doing in Maine as a place that has been farming seaweed the longest in the United States, which is still not an incredibly long time, but long enough to participate in some of the global research that's going on is really, really cool. So I would say, um, yeah, big implications for Maine's climate future. Awesome. Thank you, Jacqueline. All right, we got we got one from the from the, the group. Does growing variations of kelp and other seaweeds require licensing like the shellfish harvesting industry? Um, why don't we go to Morgan first since you are one of our farmers? Sure, yeah. Um, yes, to plant seaweed um, and keep it simple, you do need to go through the Department of Marine Resources to apply for an aquaculture lease. There are different sizes of leases that you can get, which all have different price points, um, which allow you to have either a small scale farm up to a larger scale farm, depending on your interest level or what you're trying to do. Um, and that is the same thing for mussels or oysters. They're, um, it's all the same application. You just have to specify what you're trying to grow. Awesome. Um, do we have any other comments on that? I think Morgan covered that really well and is probably the, the one to cover that. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that uh, the process takes time and planning. Um, we have an LPA here in Belfast and that took a lot of work and we had help from somebody who we brought on as a consultant to help us navigate that process. Um, so it's not something like, you know, you want to start a kelp farm, you probably won't have seed in this year at all. Uh, but it's still something that's worth doing. Uh, I did just want to put out there sort of that realistic expectation for that process. Um, Jacqueline, could you, would you mind giving a little bit of um, perspective on like where Maine's kelp farms are? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we have uh, about 40 to 50 kelp farms in the state, and there's a few different areas in which um, you can find uh, kind of clusters of them. And so, but that's that being said, they are scattered throughout the state. Uh, I think our southernmost farm is in Kittery, and our northernmost or our easternmost northernmost farm is in Eastport. So that is actually the entire state, um, but some of the areas that are kind of hotbeds for kelp would be uh, places like Casco Bay, where there's a large, um, you know, concentration of farms. And again, these are all like relatively small farms, but um, really centrally located to some of our processing um, companies like Oceans Balance. And then uh, moving down, the second area that we see a lot of development in is in the mid coast and islands. So island communities that have been fishing for a long time and are looking to diversify. And then finally, um, like where Morgan's farm is located more down east, um, where we have really, really cold water, um, which as as we've heard is awesome for farming kelp. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, so I'm going to ask another question. And just a reminder, people uh, who are in the webinar, you can throw your questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll be wrapping up in uh, another 10 to 15 minutes, um, but we would love to get them in before we go. Um, but David touched on this a little bit when he was talking about the future of Maine's seaweed industry. But I would love to ask all of the panelists um, how you hope to see main students getting involved in the future in different careers or in different um, ways in this industry and what you think is really exciting about it for these students. I can go. Yeah, great. Go for it. Um, I'll kind of speak on behalf of Jake, my partner in life and in business. Um, he grew up in, in Jonesboro, which is a tiny coastal community here in Downeast Maine, um, where I grew up in more central Maine. Um, 
but when he was growing up here, um, one of the reasons that he was super excited about aquaculture and coming back to Maine was because we really wanted to help grow an industry that we felt like could be around for a really long time and create sustainable jobs. And um, when he was growing up here, a lot of people were leaving here and they were actually literally encouraged in a lot of schools to leave this, to the, leave the area, to leave the state, to go out and find jobs in other places that there's just not a lot happening here. There's not a lot of opportunity. Um, and so we wanted to be a part of helping change that. Um, aquaculture is absolutely amazing. And there's so many different things like David already touched on that people can get involved in for the next several, men like many, many, many years, whether it's in food production or, um, you know, actual farming, there's just so many different types of, of research. I mean, you name it. Um, opportunities. And so my hope is that students learn about kelp early enough that they can then um, go on to, to apply it wherever they find it most interesting, um, because it is definitely a growing industry here in the U.S. and there's so many opportunities. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. That's a Wonderful. great story. Um, I, can, I can share a little something with you. When we started this program, there's a director in uh, Cambridge, uh, Melissa Honeywood. And she had a great idea because in Cambridge, there was a lot of uh, student activism for, uh, for more sustainable foods in their, in their uh, cafeterias. So they had a program called the Green Plate Initiative. And Melissa said, I'm going to turn them on to the kelp program and we're gonna let them make it fly. Uh, not the people who were the decision, the normal decision makers. So it was put into the hands of the high school students to bring that into Cambridge. And they used the trickle down effect of having it go into the high school students were now in the middle schools and the, the uh, lower grades to teach the lower kids the importance of uh, bringing the new food, food source of kelp not just the nutritional factors, but um, what it does for the main oceans and what it does for the diversification and bring the information. So having the students, students be the leaders in the community. Mm. Can I add on that too? <laughs> Go for it. Awesome. Um, well, I, I think it is a really, really cool time for students to be engaged in the seaweed and aquaculture space because there are tons and tons of opportunities, um, whether that is education or jobs. Um, you know, I, I spent a day long, um, I was just at like a day long summit for uh, base, like anywhere undergrad through grad students um, working in the aquaculture space who had done apprenticeships, internships, fellowships, um, all different kinds of things. And the ways in which that um, education and, and career pipeline has developed in the last five years is incredible. Um, so I think it's a it's a very exciting time for students to be involved. And it's very common working with farms uh, to hear like we're looking for help or we can't find help or we're looking for folks who do um whether that is like admin or they know the marketing or they are a skilled technician on the farm. So there's a really wide diversity of job needs that are involved in aquaculture. Um, you know, we need farmers and we also need researchers and managers and support um, organizations. So it's pretty exciting that you can think about where uh, a student's interests lie. And then there is probably an opportunity in that same area um, that's either exists or is developing. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that too. Um, I think don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. Um, we've done some work with um, Cape Elizabeth High School and got to speak with the students over there. And, um, you know, I think just um, most of these companies or researchers or um, NGOs, they're all um, pretty much an open book from what I've gathered and I've gotten a lot of information and guidance from a lot of people in the industry. And I know that um, that support would be there for anyone willing to just reach out and put your foot forward. Um, there's a lot of potential farmers we work with where we, um, you know, have different odd jobs for them. And a lot of times these relationships don't necessarily stay um, exactly where you expect them to go from when you reach out. So 
Uh, we're always an open book and would love to continue the conversation with any of the teachers or even students if you have questions. Um, and I had a, I had a quick uh, kind of selfishly a story uh, from when I was actually in fifth grade because um, I didn't re actually remember this until a couple of years ago when I got started in the industry. But um, and selfishly, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel might know who was the professor or who was involved in this program. But I was on vacation in uh, MDI Bar Harbor with my parents when I was in 1998 when I was 10. So right around fifth grade. And they enrolled me in a seaweed, um, like a week long seaweed class. And I was so disappointed because all I wanted to do was like hike and mountain bike and go swimming. And they were like, well, we're, we want some time alone. So it was like this week long, we went harvested seaweed. We had um, my first time eating seaweed. It was just like a nori roll with uh, rice. But I remember that being like the first trigger for me it was like, oh, it tastes good. Like I never would have thought. And um, come, you know, full circle 20 years later, when I got started in, in the industry, my dad was like, hey, remember you took that class back in 1998 at College of the Atlantic? And I was like, what are you, I barely remembered it, but um, you know, I, it's, it's good to see, you know, teachers planting the seed young because I feel like, you know, I was not at all interested in seaweed when I was 10, but I do feel like it, it might've had something to do with my path later mm -hmm. on, later on in life. I wanna chime in on this question before we kind of close out. And I do wanna point out just, um, you know, my experience obviously is working with older students, but they are all sort of living in a world where the climate is changing, their ocean is changing, and seaweed is not the answer, but it is a part of our climate future. And I think that it's really inspiring to work with students who see this as a, a way to be a part of helping, um, because it can look really discouraging and devastating to, to watch some of the things that are happening in the world around us. So in some ways I see kind of seaweed education is giving our young people sort of the gift of hope. And I think that's such a beautiful place to end. This panel has been amazing. I love hearing about everyone's different perspectives. Um, thank you again to each of you so much um, for participating. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, again, this is a main aquaculture innovation center um, webinar, and we are super excited to be working on this project, super excited to um, answer any of your questions. I will be reaching out to everyone who came to this webinar afterwards with contact information for all of us, so you will have that. Um, again, any of the teachers who attended this, we are offering contact hours for you, um, so that will be included in the information after. Um, and we hope to get these books into classrooms so that more people can have David's fifth grade experience and Jake's experience coming back to Maine and staying. So um, yeah, again, thank you so much and round of applause to all of you panelists for so much wonderful content that you just shared. And um, I'm gonna end it here. So until next time, folks. <laughs> <laughs>